Today's passage is from, uh, it's from Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way with which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Ash. That's pretty exciting about Lighthouse Ministries, isn't it? Especially get to, getting to hear about a new ministry that's going on. It's so needed. So that might be you that needs that. That might be a friend of yours that needs that, family member. Um, but here's the deal. It's, that's all of our ministry. So Lighthouse Ministry belongs to all of us because Jesus has one church with one mission and so it isn't just these separate ministries and churches. We're, we're together. A lot of you know Mountain Church. We're tied in deeply with Mountain Church. Uh, Daniel, their pastor, has his office here in this building, right? So um, we, there's, a, there's a group of about seven churches in Des Moines that work together that just see ourselves as just one church. And so we need to practice that more, right? So it, it, by the way, it's fun to see this room fill up more. It's exciting, isn't it? It's like, oh, it's filling up more, and pretty soon we may have to, I know we don't like doing this, but we may have to go to another service. It's like, oh, we won't see so-and-so. The goal is to reach as many people as possible, right? So we still have room up here. We we need to have people sit up in the front. Jimmy and Dahlia know that spit doesn't reach them, so from (laughs) Kent or or me. Um, And Let's fill up this room more, but uh, eventually, yeah, it'd be awesome to have another service, and maybe it's another morning service, maybe it's an evening service, but uh, I'm so glad you're here. Wherever you're coming from, um, some of you might be brand new, welcome, welcome. God's church is for everybody, it's open, and that's what we're going to see in the passage today, that the way is open for everybody, everybody's got a place uh, let's uh, let's pray, and before we pray, I just want to recognize uh, we're on, we're meeting on 9-11, aren't we? Uh, so some of you remember, you remember exactly where you were um, when the events unfolded uh, 21 years ago. And so I was just talking to someone about this earlier. We have, um, we have flight attendants gathered in, in this room. We have firefighters and first responders gathered in this room. Uh, we have people that have been deeply affected by this, right? And then uh, some of you might even know people that uh, perished in that. And one of the things, I want to I pause and pray about that, but I want us to be thinking right now, um, not just 21 years ago, but right now, there are people in going through tragedy, right? Ukraine, what has it been, 200 days now uh, going through going through a war. Uh, There's wars going on every day. There's wars going on. Let's just pray for those who are grieving, those who, let's just pray for God's justice. Let's pray that we would be the church and and meet the needs of of people. Let's pray. God, we pause uh, to just remember and to Thank you, God, that uh, you know everything that's going on, every tragedy that happens. 21 years ago, God, you, uh, you saw and you knew and you held and you, you wept and you um, cared for. And today, God, 21 years later, you do the same. You care. We love that we have a God who has come near and loves us and enters into our suffering And God, we celebrate the fact that you entered into our suffering so that one day there will be no more suffering, so that one day all justice will be perfect. And God, we look forward to the day when you're going to come and make everything right again. In the meantime, God, 
Help us to come alongside those who are grieving, come alongside those who are hurting, come alongside those who are, who are uh, just have no hope. God, thank you for holding us. Thank you for caring. Help us this morning, Lord, to understand your word and understand just how close you have come to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in Hebrews chapter 10, and we're to, okay, I want to tell you something. We're, it's like we're past all the bloody stuff, but we're not. <laughs> so Hebrews, the first good two-thirds of the, of the book is all about sacrifices and temple and priests, and, and the reason is that was God's old covenant with his people. And so he wanted, the writer of Hebrews wanted uh, the Hebrew Christians to know this is, this is part of your heritage. This is a beautiful part of your heritage. But the temple, the priests, the sacrifices are done away with in the perfect priest, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect temple. Uh, we've entitled the series, Jesus is Better. Now, it's Jesus is better than the, than the temple, the priests, the sacrifices, all that. But I want to push that theme a little further and um, dare to say, it's not really a dare, Jesus is better than anything. Anything. Whatever you think is awesome. I think the Mariners game last night was awesome. <laughs> um, but Jesus is better than that, right? If the Seahawks were to somehow beat Russell Wilson tomorrow, that would be awesome. <laughs> Jesus is more awesome, right? If you, well, you, you, now that's just sports. Some of you don't care. How many of you really don't care about sports at all? Amen, right on. Uh, so, you have your own idols. Let's talk about those. What's your, no. Uh, so we have our own idols, right? We have those things that we, we get excited about, right? And if those things, here's, how, here's one of the ways we know what our idols are. If they're taken away from us, if they're ripped away from us, like if our team loses or whatever, and if we're despondent, then it's like, that's probably an unhealthy relationship we have with that right? Whether it's money, a job, a relationship, sports, all kinds of things, right? Our material possessions. It's like you get a scratch in your car, do you freak out because you got a scratch in your car? If you do, that's an idol. Repent of that. It's a car. It's a thing, right? So, so what the, the main theme is Jesus is better than anything you could hope for. For us, we're not putting our hopes in the, in the tabernacle or the temple or the priests or the sacrifices but here's what we need to remember too that's part of our heritage the old testament is part of our heritage that's part of our family tradition we're not part of that but that's part of our background and the whole reason god went through all the the sacrifices the temple the priests and everything is because he loves you and he wants to draw near to you and he wants relationship with you so what we're going to look at, um, Ash just read this uh, so well for us. Um, it starts off, therefore, brothers. And the therefore is relating to what we talked about last week. We talked about the better sacrifice. And the week before that, we talked about the blood of Jesus. And um, because of all that, because of what Jesus did, because he died on the cross, because he rose from the dead, because he ascended, because he's our high priest, uh, let's draw near. That's what we're going to look at today. So he starts off with theology. The first part of the book is about theology. The second part of the book goes to application, daily living. A lot of you might be thinking, why don't we have just more practical sermons just on daily living? And the reason is because the Bible doesn't work that way. The Bible works with giving you strong theology first. You're theologians. Every one of you, sometimes we go, I'm not really a theologian. A theologian is someone who studies about God, right? If you want to study anything about God, you're a theologian. Uh, some of our theology is wrong, right? So if we think that God is just a force, biblically, that's not true. Now, in another religion, maybe that's true, but we don't hold to other religions. We hold, we hold that this is the Word of God, Right? We hold that this is the Word of God. And if you don't believe that, I would love to talk with you about it. Not, it's not about forcing you to believe something, but we really do believe this is the truth. And that God is a person. He's not actually three persons. He's one being and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not a force. 
It's not a sky fairy. It's not a Santa Claus to give you whatever your wishes are. He's not the policeman in the sky who just is trying to bust you every time. It's like some of you feel that way. Like God's just waiting to see me mess up, and he's just going to smack me and give me a ticket or throw me in jail. It's like, no, God is just, and he does punish sin, but God is way more merciful and loving than we've ever, ever dared imagine he is. So he starts off with theology, then he gets to life application. So theology, who is God? What has he done? And who am I? That's all part of theology. So we've got to get that right because what we believe about God determines how we live our life. If you believe that God is a big God, immeasurable, you're going to live your life as though you don't have to have everything under control. You don't have to know everything because he does. If you believe that God loves you and adores you, you don't have to go to someone else to get loved and accepted. You know you're already loved by him. So your theology is hugely, hugely important. I, I want you and all of us to be good theologians as we study God's word. But then as we study God's word, here's, a, here's another danger is one, you know, one, we can skip theology and just try to do practical living, which isn't, it's baseless. But then if we're theologians and don't practice what we're studying, then we just become Pharisees. We become super smart on things, and we don't, we don't do what he's told us to do. Big thing in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. When we were going through the Sermon on the Mount, that was one of my favorite sermon series I think I've ever preached through. It's like Jesus' words. It's like His big thing was, okay, this is, this is what the Word says. This is what God says. Now do it. So we're here gathering together every single week. We hear a sermon. Uh, next week, Dave Atkins is going to be here, so I'm excited for you to hear from Dave next week. Every week, we're going to hear a sermon. But do we do it? Do we do what he told us to do? Every day, hopefully, you're getting in the Word. Hopefully, you're getting, getting in the Scriptures. It's like, well, I had my quiet time. No, not so fast. Now it's like, practice that. Practice what you just learned. Your whole day is a quiet time, right? Your whole day is a time with God, learning what it means to follow Him. So we've got to live out our theology. And the writer of Hebrews gives us three commands. That's perfect because a, a, a preacher wants three points at least, right? Three points. I had, I had a professor say, every sermon must have at least one point. <laughs> so yeah, I don't want a pointless sermon. So three points. There's three commands that he gives us. Here's how you live out the theology of Jesus is better, okay? Here, and we're going to see this each week. We're going to see some more practical ways, but here's three ways. Commands. Do you like the word command? It's like, oh, can you soften that up a little bit? Can you say suggestions? Can you say recommendations? It's like God doesn't give recommendations. God doesn't give suggestions. He doesn't say, hey, would you please do this? Like, we do that with our kids. Like, oh, come on, I'll give you a cookie if you just do it. No, God says do it. And here's the thing about God is like, he, he says that because he loves us. Commands are good. You should go, give me some more commands, God. I need some more commands because I want to do what you want me to do. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, right? There's a way that seems right to us. In the end, it leads to death, right? We get good ideas, not such good ideas. But if our ideas come from God, they're, they're wonderful, right? It's like you go to a doctor, the doctor gives you, here's some commands, right? Here's some things you should do. And we can look at the doctor and go, well, bug off. Who do you think you are? I'm not going to do what you say, right? But the doctor is just trying to help you. God wants to help you. And so there has to be a trust in God of, when he says something, this is for our good. It is. It's always for your good. Now, it's first and foremost about his glory, right? It's first and foremost about him. Anything he tells us is because it's right, because it's in line with reality, with who he is. But when he commands us to do things, it's, it's for our own good. So it's trusting him that he wants our joy. He wants his glory, and he wants our joy, and those are congruent. It isn't just, yeah, we need to glorify God, even if we're miserable. No, 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 no. You need to be joyful in glorifying God. 
Be joyful when you, when you come and be part of the church gatherings. Be joyful as you give. Be joyful as you hear the scripture reading. Be joyful as we get opportunities to serve. So let's look at these good commands that are for our joy. Verses 19 through 22, let's read that again. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean with an evil, uh, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the first command is let's draw near. That's what he's saying. Let's draw near. Near to who? God. First of all, it's about God, right? Draw near to God. God's people in the old covenant weren't told to draw near. They weren't told to draw near. They were told to stand back. They were told to stand back. Why? Because God is perfect, and He is holy, and He is awesome, and we're sinful, and we aren't right. And in our state, in our sinful state, we can't be in the presence of a holy God. You guys remember seeing the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Faces melting and everything. That's, that's, what, that's what happens, right? Holy God, sinful people, we can't, we can't coexist in the same realm. And so something has to happen. So what God did is he protected his people. He says, okay, I'm going to speak to Moses, but only Moses. Don't even touch the mountain. Don't come up here. You will die. Does that seem like a little overkill? God, come on. I mean, sheesh, I mean, ground them or something. But no, he's just saying this is what will happen if you come just rashly into God's presence as a sinful person. So he protected Moses. Moses wasn't perfect either, was he? But Moses was chosen to be able to see a glimpse of God, to hear from God. Can you imagine what that was like on Mount Sinai when he received the commandments? Just incredible. But he protected the people. And then there was the tabernacle, right? Think of this building. Think of this as a tabernacle. Uh, and then maybe up here would be the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where God says, I'm going to have my presence dwell right in there. There was something that protected the people from that. What was it? It was a curtain, right? A veil. There was a curtain that protected them. And he protected them with that thick curtain. Isaiah 59.2 says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Leviticus 16.2 says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil or the curtain before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So this veil was probably over 60 feet tall. How tall do you think the ceiling is in here? 25 feet? 30? So just double that. Oh, man. That's, that curtain's like 60 feet in the air probably. They think, it doesn't say in the Bible, but they think uh, religious tr uh, uh, Jewish tradition says it was about four inches thick. It was a very thick curtain. Uh, reaching up 60 feet in the air. The book of Exodus teaches that this thick veil was fashioned from blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. When Jesus, who is the better priest, right, the better sacrifice, the better, the better uh, temple, when he died on the cross to pay for our sins, Matthew said something happened to the curtain. What happened to the curtain? Matthew, in his gospel, says that that curtain ripped from where to where? Top to bottom. It wasn't man ripping that curtain. It was God ripping that curtain, showing that you now have access to the presence of God. This is no little thing. This is no, It deserves a hallelujah. Because they couldn't. Aaron could only go one a day a year, and then he had to make sure he was clean. He had to make sure he sacrificed for himself first. If he wasn't right, he would die. You couldn't just waltz into God's presence until Jesus, the very presence of God, the very tabernacle, the very sacrifice for our sins, died for us, 
And because of his sacrifice, God accepted his sacrifice so that now we have access. That was ripped. It wasn't, it wasn't lifted so that the curtain can drop down again. It was ripped so you never, ever, ever have to be separated from the presence of God again. Isn't that awesome? That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. We have access to God because we believe in Jesus, that He is the Son of God. He lived a perfect life, died in our place, rose again, and seated with the Father, reigning as King and as great high priest. Verse 22 says, Let us draw near with true heart, full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Draw near because God is so good. He's cleansed you. Last week we looked at something that some of you might not have believed, but you had to keep reading it over and over and over again. That Jesus perfected you. He perfected you. And we look at that, we go, no, I didn't. <laughs> I don't feel very perfect. But there's a sense that he did. And one, we have it's God's word. He said, I perfected you in Jesus Christ. So the, the way he perfected us is when, Jesus, when God looks at us through Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, that sacrifice was good enough to cleanse you from your sin so that God says, you're in, you're my child, you're forgiven, you're clean. Not saying, well, really work on it and you will be a clean person. Really work on it and you'll be forgiven. But that's how we live, isn't it? We, every single one of us lives that way. We live on conditions because we hold other people to conditions. I'll forgive you if, like, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, whatever you've done, whatever, I know what you've done. In fact, Jesus knows the things that we don't even know we've done. He knows the things we forgot. And he forgives us. And he forgives the future sins as we trust in Him. So He's perfected you in that you do nothing to add to your salvation. You do nothing to save yourself. Now, you're not perfect in your moral character yet, right? Hopefully we're getting better. Hopefully we're becoming more and more like Jesus. That's, that's what Scripture is saying. He's sanctifying us. He's making us more holy. He's, he's perfecting us. So in a sense, we're perfected, but in another sense, we are being perfected. One day when he comes again, totally perfect, right? No more sin, no t more temptation, no more whatever, whatever, the si whatever sin affected in this, in this universe, it won't affect that anymore. Jesus is cleansing, yeah, or Jesus cleansing is better than the old covenant cleansing because it cleansed our conscience, transforming our hearts and mind. And then it says he had, uh, we had our bodies washed with pure water. I think that's referring to baptism. I think that's referring to the water of baptism, that we're buried with Christ and risen again to newness of life. And maybe you were baptized as a baby. I just want to share with you from God's Word that that isn't enough. That baptism is something we do as believers. And praise God that your parents wanted you to know Jesus. Amen. Don't disparage that at all. Don't disregard that at all. Amen. But baptism, according to Scripture, is by believers. If, if you believe and you're repenting of your sin, then we're baptized. You need to be a baptized believer. To come to Christ is, is to say, I'm totally yours. And what we see in the act of baptism is just remembering what Jesus did and dying for us and rising again for us. So that's why we do what Scripture says in, in immersing someone in water. Now, if someone, if someone says, well, I was sprinkled or I was baptized as a baby, does that mean I'm not saved? One, we can't say that. We can't say if you're saved. Only God can say that. But what, I, what we would say is just do what he says. He wants you to be baptized. Be baptized. It's a beautiful thing. We encourage you either after the service get baptized. Uh, we've had people get baptized. Community group, right, Eileen? Community group is like, I want to get baptized. And she doesn't want to get embarrassed, so I won't embarrass Eileen, who's right over there. But she... <laughs> She wanted to get baptized with the community group. Some of, some of you, it might have been the, the Puget Sound. We had a scuba diver once. He goes, I really like salt water, and I just want to be baptized in the Puget Sound. I go, okay, it's going to be cold. Let's do it. And then it could be the Angle Lake. It could be a swimming pool. It could be a hot tub. It could be, we baptized a lady in her bathtub. She was on hospice. She didn't have much more time to live. She was living in her home. 
we baptized her in her bathtub as several people carried her so gently to the bathtub. But it's important, right? It's important that we're baptized. It's important that we know that we've, we've decided to follow Jesus. That's the whole point, uh, is that we can draw near because he's the one that cleansed us. It, it wasn't the water that cleansed you, right? It's Jesus that cleansed us. Some Christians still worship from afar, though, and that might be you. You might go, man, I just don't feel very close to him. I feel like there's a separation, and, and there isn't, right? But there are, there are things that become separations. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes a relationship can keep you from getting close to Jesus. And I want to say, is that relationship worth your salvation? Is that relationship that's keeping you from Jesus worth more than Jesus? No, I hope not. In practicality, it is, right? For me, in high school, my friendships were more important than my relationship with Jesus, practically. I would have never said that. But the way I was living my life was that I was letting them be a barrier between my... I wasn't drawing close. Drawing close is like, church is open, I'm there, right? Drawing close is, I'm getting in the Word this morning. Oh, you mean, I can't, can't I have night devotions too? Yeah, have night devotions. What about afternoon devotions? Yeah, I want to have those too. Drawing close to God is like every chance you get just being near Him and worship Him and understand that He loves you. And he's, He has everything to do with every part of your life. Do you know that? You're eating, you're drinking, you're being a family, you get to go to the fair. God's in the very midst of that, right? We get to go to Florida this next week, and we're excited. We're going, yeah, it's going to be awesome. We're going to go see the sunrise at the beach, and my daughter looks at the weather app. She goes, it's going to rain every single day we're there. <laughs> awesome. Great. So we'll celebrate the rain in Florida. Thunderstorms. Anyone experience thunderstorms in the south or the Midwest? Yeah, nothing like it. It's like, it feels like the world is ending. It's so awesome. <laughs> Thunder is so awesome there. Um, so draw near, and here's what I want to encourage you with. Draw near. Do you have doubts? Draw near to God. Do you have sin in your life? Did you sin this morning? Draw near to God. Don't let that be a barrier, right? When you feel like you're unworthy, I know some of you came in here and you're going, I don't feel worthy. Maybe they're worthy, but they don't know what I've done. They don't know what I've been going through. And God says, draw near. Draw near. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, Is this not a delightful thought that when I came before the throne of God, I feel myself a sinner, but God does not look upon me as one? When I approach him to offer my thanksgiving, I feel that I am unworthy in myself, but I am not unworthy in that official standing in which he has placed me. As a sanctified and perfected thing in Christ, I have the blood upon me. God regards me in my sacrifice, in my worship, and in myself as being perfect. So draw near with assurance because the good news, because of the good news of what Jesus has done. Number two, second command is let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Who's your hope in? Who's your hope supposed to be in? Jesus, right? It gets twisted. We put it in other things. But it should be in Jesus. That's who our true hope is in. Biblical hope isn't like wishful thinking, like, I sure hope that the Mariners win the World Series. I hope, you know, I hope that this happens. I hope this. That's not biblical hope. Hope is it's a sure thing. I'm looking forward to that future reality. That's what biblical hope is. Biblical, biblical hope is solid assurance, sure thing, hope. So, Hold on to your hope in Jesus without wavering. There's a lot of people who started out holding on to Jesus and they lost their grip, right? They lost their grip. That might be you. And I'm so glad you're here. Oh man, does God love prodigals? Does God ever love prodigals? Those who just like, you were following Jesus really strongly at one time and then it's gone really bad. And Jesus goes, Come on, because I love you. It isn't like, oh yeah, let's hear this story, right? That isn't, that isn't God. But it's not the picture that, God, that Jesus gives us in Luke 15. 
Jesus gives us the picture of, of the father welcoming the prodigal who spent everything and wished he had his father's stuff. He would rather his dad was dead than, than and, and rather have his stuff and his dad dead than, than be with his dad, right? And so he left and he squandered everything. And then he came back, tail between his legs. Maybe I can be a servant. Maybe I can just, and you know what the father, Jesus says, this is what your father's like. He ran towards that son He picked him up, hugged him, kissed him, threw a party, put a ring on his finger, put a robe on him, right? And then the one, the the really religious kid who is in the background going, what are you making such a big deal? I've been doing everything. I've been here with you, right? And Jesus wants us to see that it isn't about, it's all about his love for us. No matter what you've done, because we've all screwed up, every single one of us. Every single one of us. There's not one of us where any of us would go, that's impressive, right? If we got down to the dirty dirt of all of our lives, we'd be going, "Hmm, yep, you need Jesus. Every single one of us. And God loves us, and he adores us. And when when we've left for the hundredth time and we come back, he goes, come on, let's do this. I love you. Not shaming, not guilting but just calling you to follow him. So don't let discouragement take root. Hold fast to your hope in Jesus. And the NIV says, hold, hold unswervingly. The New Living Translation says, hold tightly. I love that. Hold tightly. The message says, keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. Keep a firm grip on those promises. How? How do we do that? Remember, who's faithful? He's faithful when we're not faithful. He's faithful. He who promised is faithful. Focus on Jesus, not yourself. When everything is changing around us, we need something firm to hold on to. You know that our world is changing, right? Every, the things that we hoped in before, it's like, eh, down the tubes. I guess that wasn't what we were supposed to hope in. But Jesus is faithful. God is faithful. You can have full assurance of salvation, full assurance of direct access to God, full assurance that your sins are forgiven. Amen, hallelujah to that one. Come on, we need to know that. You know, your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Stop trying to pay for them. Stop trying to add to what he's done already because God is faithful. Since it's a confession of hope, here's the thing. Is if it's a confession of hope, it's not just something we firmly believe, right? It's something we confess. It's something we tell people. So there's a lot of people, not only in this room, but outside this room, they desperately need hope. Desperate for hope. This month is National Suicide Awareness Month. And there's people right now that are thinking, it'd be better if I just took my life. There's nothing worth living for. And we want to say, no, 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 no. No, there is something worth living for. He's your savior. He's your friend. He's your creator. He's the one that everything, he's going to make all things right one day. And it is hard right now. And maybe that's you right now. Maybe that's you. I just, want to, I just want to remind you, or maybe tell you for the first time, there is hope, and his name is Jesus. Please, please look to Jesus. Last one, last command, is let us consider how to stir one up one another. Uh, verses 24, 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So throughout the book of Hebrews, those who are addressed are called brothers, and you could translate it brothers and sisters. This isn't just talking about men. It's brothers and sisters. It's family. Because we are brothers and sisters in the family of God, here's here's what's true of us, is we belong to one another. And that's not just Normandy Christian Church, right? That's the gathering. That's Mountain Church. That's, you know, all these churches, we belong to each other. It isn't just Jesus. There's there's nothing in the Bible that just says, just you and Jesus, just keep living your life and ignore everybody else. It's about corporate. In fact, the book of Hebrews, in fact, all the books really 
are written to a group of people. Not just to, you know, even, even the ones Paul writing to Timothy, it's about a group of people. So the book of Hebrews is about a family. We belong to one another. There is no such thing as a private Christian life. Solely Christ, uh, private Christian life. Uh, Hebrews is not written to a singular person, but a church, a group of believers. And this passage, so I, I read this, and, and you've heard this before, not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some. And it's been misused. That passage has been misused. And so we said things during the pandemic like, no, we got to get together on Sunday mornings. Don't neglect meeting together. That's not what it says. It says, it says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Do you know there's more ways to stir up one another for love and devotion and encouragement than Sunday mornings? If you made the Christian life all about Sunday mornings, you've got a very, very small view of Christianity. This is just the huddle. <laughs> I'm Coach Carroll, right? And you guys are the Seahawks. And so what we're doing right now, we're, we're huddling up because life is happening out there. When we go out these doors, someone's going to tell you, there's no God. Why do you trust in Jesus? Someone's going to make you mad and test you. And, and it was great singing songs in here to Jesus, but what about out there? What songs are you singing out there? It's like, this is only a little part. So God wants us, get this, every day to be involved in each other's lives. Every day. That doesn't mean come here tomorrow and we're going to do this all over again, but get involved in each other's lives. Community group is part of that, right? We need that. Community group is huge. So if you're not part of a community group, get in the community group. But do things together as believers. All of life is about submitting yourself to the Lordship of Jesus. So do that with other people. Um, stir up. And I love that. I love that word. I love, I love that word, stir up, because some of you love, I'm one of those. I love to stir up people. I don't know. It's that, it's that part. Uh, some of it I need to repent of, and some of it is good. I know. It's a spiritual gift to stir up. It's like you want to stir up. There's a bad part of stir up, but this is a good stir up, right? Provoke is another word you can use for this. So how, how many of you are with me? It's like, oh, yeah, I, I like to provoke. Uh, uh, bug. How many of you love to bug people? That's always, my brother will tell you. It's just like bugging. Actually, we were both probably pretty gifted at bugging each other. But uh, bugging, provoking, uh, stirring up one another, spur one another on. Some of you have that in there. Think about spurs. Like, what does that do when you have spurs with a, with a horse? It's like, oh, ouch. All right. Stir up one another to love and good deeds. Get each other doing things that are about other people and not just themselves. Stir up one another. So that, and when you serve, you'll find... You'll, I was a youth pastor for over 20 years. And some of the funnest things for the youth that they would just talk about are the times where we served. Not the times where we would go to Wild Waves or we'd go to just the amusement parks or whatever, but it was when we served, when we go to Mexico and build houses or whatever. You are... You're becoming like Jesus. That's what Jesus came to do, is to serve. And you're like Jesus when you serve. Okay, now I want to, here's, here's a practical way I want to give you. Some of you got this, this little pamphlet in the mail this last week, maybe yesterday. Did you get that in the mail? You got a letter from us. If not, it's coming Monday. Uh, you'll get it. If you're a regular attender or a member, if, uh, if you would like one of these, you can pick them up on the way out. Uh, Brian's got a, a handful of those. We're going to... This tells you, okay, let's just look at these. Are there any opportunities to serve at Normandy Christian Church? Okay, just a few. It's like, Pastor, I really can't find anything to do. Well, let me find something for you, right? So, so band, do you play an instrument? Do you sing? We could use more people in that. Um, sound technicians. Linda, do we need more sound technicians? Yeah, video technicians. Yeah, we could use more. Recording sermons, guess what? Who does that? Me. It's kind of awkward recording yourself and then put yourself up on YouTube. But, uh, so that's doing that right now. It's pretty self-automated, but we need someone to edit it, put it on YouTube. Some of you might be love that. There's things like ambient arts. What's ambient arts? It's just making, it's like, hey, let's, let's try some different colors here. Let's try, 
uh, Christmas is coming up. We're going to decorate this place. Or the four-year, just looking at things. If you're that kind of person, uh, we could use people that are gifted in that area. Platform breakdown on Sundays, just helping us clean things up and like getting cords together and so we're not tripping over them all the time. And There's all kinds of ways. Linda uh, Del Santina, we could use some more people in the cafe, can't we? So we can use people helping in that. Linda's been doing that awesomely. Awesomely, is that a word? Um, so youth ministry, Anon's not here, but Aaron is. Could we use help in the youth ministry? Absolutely. Pray for Anon. He busted his knee. He did something to his knee, so pray for him. Children's ministry, there's a lot of those kids up there. We need help. I've seen the youth, I've seen the children's workers after Sunday. They need help. Uh, grounds upkeep. Did you know there's, if you just had some clippers and you go, man, I, my, that's my ministry, I, I clip the bushes. I'm, it's like, but that's not anything. Yes, it is. Because first impressions are a big deal. Some of you came for the first time, you're going, those hedges really need to be clipped. <laughs> right? So, so if, if that, maybe that's your ministry, clipping, clipping yard, the yard and making it look nice. We have beautiful gardens here, don't we? We want to make sure that they're part of our grounds upkeep is uh, Steve and Linda next door. They water our plants. They, they do so much just to help us, and they don't even go to this church, right? Because they're part of the church. They're part of the church. Photography. We need people to, to take pictures. We need events set up and take down. We need a church clerk. You just come to our board meeting once a month, and you take notes. We still need someone for that one, right? Uh, hospitality. When we have funerals and weddings and when we have guests come and when we have people that need overnight stay that, that are guests, we need someone to help with that hospitality, helping take care of things. Barnabas Bunch, that's on, is that, that's the last, the fourth Saturday of the month, um, and usually gals, but it doesn't have to be just gals, right, um, get together, and it's, Barnabas is known as the son of encouragement, and it's praying for people that need encouragement and writing notes of encouragement uh, to people. So if that's a ministry, you, James Brigade, uh, what a wonderful ministry. Guys, um, we're so blessed when we get to serve, aren't we? It's like, man, we feel more blessed than the people when we think the people that we've helped. It's an awesome ministry. Transportation, we need to help get people here and then get them home again because they'd like that. Uh, guest follow-up, missions, short term there's all kinds of things. This pamphlet will tell you more detailed, but this is a very practical way for you to stir one another up to love and good deeds, right? So free food Friday, we can use more people out there. It's been awesome. So who's been part of the free food Friday at any time at all? So it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? Because it's, it's not only helping our communities, but, but we get to know each other better. And we get to see how crazy Ed is. He's just, he is a nut and we love him. And he's in charge of the meat. Don't take over his department. He's got that, he's got, made me think of the Joe Albertson's commercial. All right. Uh, so, so Galatians 5, 13 and 14 says, You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The scripture goes on to say, don't neglect meeting together. Encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. He's coming again. We need to encourage each other. He's coming again. We need to serve. He's coming again. We need to keep drawing near because there's going to be a day where we can't do these things. We can't, we can't serve one another. We're going to be serving in another capacity when, when we get to be in the new heavens and new earth. Encourage one another now. Bug each other to come, right? Whether, whether it's this or community groups or, or getting involved in ministry in love. Bug each other in love. Uh, encourage one another. Another step you could take is joining a community group on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Another, another step is, have you, have you first of all given your life to Jesus Christ? And maybe you have, but you've never been baptized before, and you want to find out more about that. You can, you can talk to anybody anytime. I do want to let you know of an opportunity on October 9th. Miss Nancy, Nancy Wayner, our children's and women's minister, is going to be meeting with whoever has questions about baptism just for a 45-minute class after church on October 9th. There'll be some food up there. Go up to the upper room. We call it the upper room. Upper room with Nancy. And um, 
She'll just answer some questions. You'll have to look at some scripture on baptism. Are you involved in ministry? The way you get involved in ministry, so here's, here's, here it is. This is, I think, 2022 is going to be a new year. Not only are we, you don't know this yet, we're going to be North Hill Christian Church. Yeah, next month, maybe. <laughs> we're still waiting on that. But it's going to be North Hill Christian Church. Same church, same people, same ownership, right, Jesus. Uh, so, but, but just different name, just so that we can accurately describe where we are, because we're not in Normandy Park. North Hill, um, but here's how here's how you're forever more now going to get involved in ministries is you you talk to someone say hey I'd like to be involved in one of those ministries or these cards there's a card down here and in the card these are important for us we like to know that you're here if if you ha- have an email or phone number we can get a hold of you on but now it says I'd like more info on committing my life to Jesus, or baptism, membership, RSVP for the starting point class, discipleship groups, community groups, and then the last one is ministry opportunities. So if you want to get involved in the youth ministry, you put specific youth ministry, just write that in, youth ministry, and then we'll contact you. Say, hey, here's what it would involve, here's what you could do, here's different ways you can get involved in that. So you go, I want to find out how I get involved in such and such ministry right here. Use this card. This is the magic card. And then you can put it, put the card in the offering as it goes by as we sing, or there's a box in the back, Brian, right, wave your hand right behind Brian. There's a box, and you can put that in the box um, along with offerings. That would be awesome. So um, as we get ready to take partake of communion, the main topic here is about drawing near. And the beautiful thing about Christianity is While we weren't drawing near, Jesus drew near. Jesus came near to us. And because He drew near, we can draw near to Him. Paul says this about the Lord's Supper that we get to partake. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we encourage you to have this time uh, with the cup and the bread. And if you don't have that, Brian can bring that to you. You can raise your hand. He'll bring that to you. But Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And listen to this last part. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is something we're going to do over and over again until he comes. We're anticipating he's coming again. He's making everything right. And Jesus says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drink from this cup again until I see you in the new heavens, right? until I see you in the kingdom. So one day we get to be with Jesus face to face. But right now we're proclaiming his death until he comes. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you draw near to us so that we can draw near to you. God, I pray that we don't try to worship you from afar, but that we'd recognize that you're, you're just as close to us as our breath. God, that you dwell in us as believers. God, I pray for anyone here who doesn't know you. God, that today would be the day that they, they claim you, they, they declare you as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray for all of us that we would be involved in ministry, that we'd be involved not just here, but everywhere. Uh, at Lighthouse even. God, just help us to be involved in ministry together, stirring up one another to love and good deeds. And God, thank you that you served us so that we can serve others. It's in Jesus' awesome name that we pray. Amen.